Charles Bush. <laughs> Is walking down the hall. So you're in luck. Oh, yeah. This is, you know, what I kind of dreamed of when I thought of that. So um, I want to say thank you to Edmund and Mel for being here. Um, <laughs> so uh, one of Mel's books that he has published of his work, Edmund wrote the, uh, the introduction for in, was it 1984? 84, yes. 84. Dreamer. And I just wanted to read a couple paragraphs from that. Uh, Edmund wrote about Mel's work, which you're all looking at around the room. Um, he wrote, uh, almost all of the images in this book were first rendered as advertisements or as illustrations of magazine stories. And yet they resist their function, hold their secrets in reserve, refuse to comply. And almost all of Odom's images of people, sex elusive, age unknown, race mestizo, who seem to be incestuously related, not only to one another, but also to certain flowers and to animals of prey. Sometimes his people metamorphosize into gorillas or into angels. Uh, to produce this kinship with the non-human, the faces have been deprived of creases, defects, hollows, in short, of character, psychology, experience. As faces, they are the opposite of those twin aspects of Janus. Since Odom's people have neither a future nor a past, they are lost in the eternal present of the dream. So, <laughs> so with that, I will let Thank you. the gentleman take it away. Thank you. I, I, I know that from looking at various interviews of you that uh, that people have a hard time placing you as as an artist or as an illustrator, and uh, I I got the same thing. Are you a journalist or are you a novelist? And uh, uh, but to me, it's all the same thing. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I think um, art is illustration seen from a distance. I mean, the the Sistine Chapel ceiling was um, illustration. It was selling what the church was selling. And um, I think 
so much of that figurative art of that period was advertising or illustration. I think now if we look back on it in the same way that Greek statues now have those garish colors removed, we remove these garish reasons for things being created and they become art from a distance. But I think it's all the same thing. I think it's all sort of in the immediate. That it's and, and your illustrations always were mysterious and not too message oriented. I mean, or at least uh, the, the look the onlooker could attribute his own message. That was the point. I wanted people, I always put questions in my work so that people would come up with their own stories because I think something means so much more to you if you can relate something of your life to that story. I didn't want it to be spelled. I, I hate when people say, what is this drawing about? It's about what you bring to it. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, you, you, you probably still live on West 76? I do. I shouldn't mm -hmm. be aware of it. Don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but uh, my, my dearest oldest friend, Marilyn, yeah. lived, lived on the street. She died a couple of years ago. Oh, but, I didn't know that. But we used to always walk by uh, Mel's window, and there was always something so enchanting in the window. Mm -hmm. And uh, Not me. <laughs> <laughs> but there were lovely objects or flowers or something, and, and we often times would bother you. And it was never a bother, I promise. I loved Marilyn. Marilyn was one of my favorite neighbors. Yeah. Um, and wasn't she a character in The Beautiful Room is Empty? That's several of my books. Well, I recognized her from that one, and I, I, as I was reading it, I'm going, oh my God, this is Marilyn. <laughs> and I sort of quizzed her on that, and she was like, oh, well, maybe, I don't know, you know, she, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, I was interested in, in looking at the uh, various uh, things that, uh, interviews of you, that, I mean, I grew up in a very uh, barbaric Texas family, mm. where there was not one book, mm. and, uh, <laughs> and I, I see that you grew up in a very small town, but with very permissive parents who, encourage you yes. to, to be an artist and you started drawing when you were three or four? Yeah, yeah. I have drawings that date back to when I was four. I, I don't know how I was so fortunate, but my, um, my mother in particular, and I think this is fairly normal and routine, um, I, I suspect one of the things she loved about my drawing was that I was quiet and out of the way <laughs> while I was doing it. I think that was a big part of her encouraging that. But I think my parents understood very early on that it was who I was because they didn't ask me to do it. They never even suggested that I do it. I just started doing it and then I did it every day and a lot of the time. Secretly at night. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And I would, in school, that became my identity. I was the kid who could draw, so I would do, and I was not good in all subjects, so I would do special posters and bulletin boards in the subjects I was lousy in to make up for extra credit, you know, to get extra credit, to get through, and it became who I was, this, you know, this guy who drew. And um, it was I, interesting to me, I was uh, curious about your, uh, who your influences might be, and all on my own, I guess, Aubrey Beardsley, mm -hmm. and then I was pleased to see that you mentioned him as one of My favorite art, no, my favorite artist, uh, my very favorite uh, artist. And, uh, and uh, other people you mentioned were, uh, well, you mentioned Disney. Yeah. Looking at Disney, and uh, especially the Silly Symphony. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mermaids, fairies. Um, I lived in a fantasy world far more elaborate and um, than my parents ever guessed. I mean, I believed everything I saw, so. Did you have imaginary friends? I yeah. had imaginary friends. I, 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 had, I had toys that I, ascribed personalities to, that I would talk to, that were my, my friends that I would carry with me. I mean, I was, um, I was, I spent a lot of time in the woods. I lived, I grew up about two blocks from actual woods, mm -hmm. and I was fearless in going into the woods, because I loved it. I, I, I never felt threatened, I never felt scared. Now I'm a wuss. I would be, you know, because oh, you know, I've lived in New York so many years. But um, my, back then my mother would make me take my pants off on the back porch sh so she could shake them out because I would come home with snakes and frogs and stuff in my pockets. So, I mean, I was, but it, it was a lovely counter 
to my imagination, to be in the real world, in that real in world, world yeah. and to understand things sort of organically from how that worked. And uh, I see that another one of your, that movie stills of mm. movie stars uh, was something that you liked. And movies too, lots did, of movies. Did you, uh, well you're so young, did you watch movies on I did, I did, and my parents would go to bed and I would get up and sneak into the living room and turn the sound down really low and watch movies at night after my parents uh -huh. had gone to sleep till one night I fell asleep on the floor and they found me there in uh -huh. front of the TV and uh -huh. I was sort of curtailed from that for a while. But, um, <laughs> um, I, and I, when I saw old movies, I did not realize they were old. old. I just thought they were someplace else that looked like that, mm -hmm. that I really wanted to be living, yeah, yeah. but because um, it was so pretty. You yeah. know, and everybody had good clothes and great lighting, and you know, yeah. and yeah, right. yeah. And, and yeah, I also saw that the pre-Raphaelites oh. and George O'Keefe were people. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Can you see the in the flower imagery, the O'Keefe and flowers? Well, I, um, I was, I always gravitated to what I thought was like beautiful, um, like the pre-Raphaelites are, so, are these dreamy images, and they're. Um, and they're very androgynous, too. Very, very much so. You, you don't know whether they're women or men. Exactly, exactly, like Burne Jones and Rossetti's. Yeah. Yeah. They were, so um, I, when I, the town I grew up in was 4,000 people, and there were no museums, and there were no galleries, and my earliest um, exposures were to magazines, to magazines, and you know, beautiful paintings of Jello or, you know, cosmetics or whatever. And that's what I drew from. And, and then I, when I was about seven, I started having drawing lessons, and the lady who taught me drawing had art books. And I, that opened up another, oh, whole, wow. another whole thing Amazing. for me. And then it, I was surprised to see that you had this, uh, studied in London for a couple of years after you went to college in America. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what were you studying there? Well, in, um, I went to, I went to um, Leeds Polytechnic Institute of Art and Design, and I studied graphic, um, what was it called, what was the classes? Oh, but I ended up drawing there. And, I ended, and everyone hated my work there. No one, yeah. one, one, one teacher liked it, and um, who I'm still friends with, actually. And um, I just would, I started going home and just drawing for him. Because I knew he was gonna, he was my audience, yeah. the, the single audience. And then I moved to London and I studied music for a while. What did you do? What kind of music? La 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 la. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was cleaning house one day and I was singing. And the, the as I was cleaning house, I was alone, and an older gentleman from the floor below me came up and, and no, his wife came up and said, "You have a lovely voice, Mel. I would like my husband Harold to hear it." And I'm like. Maybe this is some British, like, you know. Seduction. No, no, I didn't think that. No, 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 I didn't think that. These people, these people were past that. Um, but, 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 he, but then the next day, Harold came up, Harold um, Miller, and he said, would you come sing for me? He had this great big piano, and I sang, and he says, he loved my voice. So he started, I started going to Wigmore Hall and, and having classes with him, and, and he, Introduced me to people. He got me an audition for uh, uh, someone dropped out of a show in London, Billy, a, a musical adaptation of Billy Liar, yeah. and Michael Crawford was starring in it. And I went and auditioned for that. And I was too young for the role, but somebody suggested me for the role of Henrik in A Little Night Music, a 23-year-old divinity student. And but I couldn't get any of the papers. You know, and and because they were already having America, some American cast members in the cast, they couldn't have more. Right. So, yeah. You know. Well, uh, music loss is our game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I came back and I actually studied at Carnegie Hall for here for a while, but I had been drawing for so long, and if I had to choose one thing that was going to be what I felt I was really about, it would have been drawing. And so uh -huh. I stopped doing that. I don't like dil being a dilettante. I like focusing on something and really doing it. Uh, same way. And I, I mean, I, I, I would play the harp. I'd play the harpsichord. I'd play the flute. I'd wow. throw. But I was lousy at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's different. <laughs> so the, only, the only thing I was good at was uh, writing. So. 
but that was the thing. I was, I was good at singing, but I wasn't good with the rejection that came along with it. That part was yeah. deadly. And, and that's one thing. I mean, you can draw, and you're alone, and you're drawing, and you're in your own head, and you're in your own room, and you, you bring it, and they, uh, you know, you've already shown them the sketch, so they know what to expect. You get very little rejections in that. And anyway, they're not based on the way you look. Right, right, right. How right. old you are. Exactly, or exactly. Based I, on your work. It was a much more embracing profession for me, and it was also what I had done since I was four. You know, been alone right. drawing. Yeah. I mean, it was it was really like it never felt like I got a, a, a career because I had always been doing that. It's just people started paying me. Now your te technique, I was interested in reading, is is it's pencil. Uh huh. Yeah. But these are all pencil. Yeah, right. pencil over dyes, and the backgrounds like the black or this sky is gouache. Uh -huh. And I cut a stencil to on um, well on this one to cover all the, an acetate stencil to cover all the drawn areas, and then I put a layer of color down, and I fleck with a toothbrush. It's a very old technique, I mean, I, and, and just like this ombre from the orange up to the blue is just painted it blue, and then with orange flecked over the blue to get that, uh -huh. that gradual, you know, oh, fade. Uh-huh, interesting. And, uh, Tell us a little bit about um, your doll world. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I had played with dolls from the time I was a baby. I was a big sissy. Everyone in the neighborhood knew it. I had my own doll stroller. Um, my, again, I had, very, I had a very lenient parents. When I tell this to people that this was in a small town in the South, they can't imagine. Southern Baptist. Oh, yeah, very. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I designed the makeup for a friend of mine who designed a doll. And I didn't think, I thought she needed better makeup, so I designed, <laughs> I designed the makeup for her. And um, after I did that, I did a drawing of a face that if I were going to be doing a doll, which I wasn't thinking of doing, this was gonna just be a drawing, would be the face. Mm -hmm. And um, it stayed over my drawing table for months, and I would change, you know, I'd look at it and I'd change it. And it, it wasn't an assignment, nobody was waiting for this. So I had all the time in the world, and I, I named her. I named her, and I decided she was a movie star. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I, we always, Marilyn and I always thought it looked like Jean Tierney. Well, Jean Tierney's my favorite movie star. Oh, okay. But, um, not my favorite actress, but my favorite movie star. Oh, yeah, right. And there's a difference in that. And I, I pref actually prefer the movie star thing mm -hmm. because that's generally based on something intangible that's between them and the camera. It's not technique. Yeah. It's just something that's either there or it's not there. There are wonderful actors who don't register on film. Yeah, uh, I, I can't remember. I think it was uh, uh, some English critic who said, yeah, on stage you act, but in movies you are. Mm -hmm. You just exist. I think that's exactly it. So I, I did this drawing, and um, I started, I had done some drawings of Barbie that had been published in books and magazines, in Playboy magazine, and I did a drawing of Barbie that was used as an illustration for David Bowie's Young Americans in a, in a book called Radio Eyes, where artists illustrated rock songs. And um, so I had this tiny little sliver of a reputation in the doll world. And also I collected, I had Barbies, I had, actually I had a kick-ass collection of Barbies, vintage Barbies, that I since, since auctioned off. But um, I started getting calls from stores saying, we'd like to buy your doll. Friends of mine had seen the drawing and said, Mel Odom's designing a doll, and this was in Barbie's low spot in, in her creative evolution, and, and dealers and collectors were looking, literally looking for something new. And I, just, and I honestly had not thought to do this in real life. I was just gonna do the drawing. And then um, my best friend, Brian Scott Carr, got ill with AIDS. And I knew I was going to be the one to take care of him. His family was in the Midwest and they were estranged. You know, it's a story that happened Millions of, times. millions of times. And I needed something very detail intensive to do because I knew from experience by then that it was going to be very long. 
long, and difficult. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was going to actually design this doll because I needed... How big is she? 15 and a half inches tall. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then by sheer chance, I, I got a sculptor to work with, a really wonderful man, lives in New York, Michael Ebert. And um, his studio turned out to be three blocks from my friend's hospital. Oh, you're lucky. And I thought that was the sign I needed, mm -hmm. that this is gonna, one of these things is gonna help you get through the other one of these things. And so I would go to uh, Beth Israel and visit him there, and it was invariably bleak and sort of happened to tear. Back then, people went very quickly. Yeah. Uh, this was in, this was in like 91, and people died mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I would go, I'd, I'd leave there in an absolute blue funk and walk the three blocks to Michael's studio. And, um, into a doll world. Into a doll world. And, I'm, and I never thought of the, at the time I didn't think of, that I'm leaving where my friend is deteriorating and wasting away and I'm going and I'm creating this perfect little being. Uh -huh. You know, this pink and pretty and beautiful eyes and healthy and beautiful figure. And, and it was the thing that I would gradually come out of my funk each time I'd go to the sculptor. Sure. It would be like, you know, because he was such, he was, and, and he's, he was a married man, is a married man, and his wife was pregnant at the time, and they couldn't have sex. So his horniness went into my doll. <laughs> like, like, he told me this, he told me this. He said, I'd come in and she would have these perfect, beautiful breasts. And I'm like, Michael, she's gorgeous. And he's going, you don't know. <laughs> you really don't know. And, and, she, and she would have beautiful muscles in her back and these beautiful legs. And I said, huh? And he told me that. He said, I can't touch my wife right now. Right. And that's where all that's going is into this. So I lucked out and got this really sweet, sensitive, straight man's horniness poured into my doll. <laughs> so it was, it was the best. It was really good. And, and we became friends. We became friends. And he understood what I was going through. I knew, uh -huh. He knew I knew I was coming from the hospital. So he wouldn't be chipper and expect me to be, you know, anything but what I was yeah. when I walked in. And, and so it was a really, it saved me. It really saved me doing that. Um, I, 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 I don't want to take the focus, but I, I, uh, I, I was a good friend in Paris of Billy Boy. And Billy Boy was a jewelry designer who had 10,000 Barbies. Yes. And, uh, and then eventually began to design his own doll, Mid Von. Yes. And all of her relatives. Yes. Enemies and friends. And, um, and, and but he knew he, of enemies. Yeah, <laughs> but he, uh, I, I was with him and a Hollywood producer for some reason at lunch and uh, one day, and, and Billy Boy started talking about how all of his Barbies were on display in the Jardin d'Acclimation or whatever you say, and uh, in a train that oh yeah and that Mate, Mattel Mattel had paid for it. So there we went in this Hollywood producer's limo to to look and we were the only people who were over three feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> looking at all these Barbies and I helped him set up some of that train. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, I came I came to, I, I went to Paris and stayed with him for a while and helped him work on putting things into this train and, and um, went to the opening and it was like uh -huh. Sonia Riquier, all these incredible designers yeah, showed up. Yeah, yeah. Everybody on earth, including Madame Gray yeah. and, and Yves Saint Laurent, he, everybody. He had us 87 Couturier yeah. to design costumes for Barbie. And they did. And they did. The only one I considered stealing was the Madame Gray one and yeah. I had it in my hand and it was like I was looking for the closest door. <laughs> but it, 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 would not, it would not have worked out. But it was, it was, na I could, I, it was navy blue, ta it was so beautiful, it was she so beautiful. Oh, absolutely one of the most the, genius. One of the most. Anyway, uh, somebody in one of these uh, interviews uh, pointed out that Really, most of your pictures are portraits. They're not full length. Right. And that, yeah. in a way, that's related to the movies. Close-ups. Close-ups, yes. Because yeah. yes. that's when they bring out the, the lighting. 
That's when they, you know, you can see somebody from a distance in a film, and then when they come in for a close-up, it's the filter, and it's the lighting, and it's the music, and the wind machine. I mean, that's when they're really trying to make you fall in love with that person. Yeah. So I learned from that. And you mentioned uh, in one interview Sternberg's treatment of oh, Dietrich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that was the ultimate expression of love. Oh, absolutely. He could not have been more madly in love with her on film. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, who knows? Otherwise? Who knows? But on film, he was her ardent suitor and he made her look like a goddess. I mean, you, when you look at them, you can't think otherwise. They're so beautifully arranged around her. Isn't it strange that gay men? who most people assume aren't interested in women, were actually the ones who write, I'm writing a novel about two women now, uh, uh, you, you know, were the ones who dress women yeah, yeah, yeah. and draw them. And uh, do people think that for us, all those women are in drag or? No, you know, my, I have a, I, I took one of those tests yeah. one time on, online. You know, <laughs> what percentage of your personality is masculine? What, Mine was 50-50, right, literally, right down the line. Yeah. And I was so thrilled Gross. when I saw that. <laughs> um, because I, like, uh, many of my best friends are women. Mm -hmm. I mean, always have been. I mean, the people, uh, like, living close to me. I have two friends since college living within three blocks of me. Two girlfriends mm -hmm. from college within two blocks of me. Three blocks of me. And um, I, I think one of the things is they know I don't want anything from them. Yeah. I'm not trying to get anything into over on them or get into their beds or yeah. panties or, yeah. or, you know. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and I think my feminine, the 50% of my personality that's feminine, I think they are comfortable with me because of that. Well, also, women and gay men have to deal with this horrible, brutish, impossible thing called men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I um, grew up, I, but the funny thing, when I was a kid, I had a lot of girlfriends who would play with dolls, paper dolls, all that stuff, but my two best guy friends were the two biggest hell raisers in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be playing with paper dolls, and then I'd go blow stuff up in the woods with them, you know, and bit, burn down forts and things. I mean, literally, literally. Um, our parents would have, you know, we would have, oh, they would have, my mother would have had a stroke if she had known the things I was doing. Uh, I was intrigued to see that when your father was dying, you were uh, drawing an Al Parker Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. For him. Okay, okay. Um, it's not as it's not as lurid as that sounds. Um, I Al Parker is a gay model, a, a gay porn star, gay porn very star. successful one, very very beautiful. Um, no no longer with us. Um, my father was a very hardcore Southern Baptist, and I had drawn a, a pastel drawing of Jesus when I was fifteen, and he had it hanging in his bedroom, and I wanted to give him another Jesus image as an adult, and I started on this drawing, and I was looking for a model to draw from, and I happened on Al Parker, and I thought, that's it. I mean, he was even the right age, you know. The, um, I think Jesus was supposed to have died when he was 33, and that was the age of Al Parker. And so I did a drawing, I started a drawing of Jesus based on a photo of Al Parker, actually a couple of photos of Al Parker that I had. And then my father just had a heart attack, just dropped dead. And I never gave him the drawing, and I put the drawing away for years because it has so much guilt about my not having finished it and my having given it to them and so much regret yeah. at not being able to have shared this with them. And then I found it, gosh, I don't know, not too many years ago, the drawings. I, I put sketchbooks away and will not look at them for decades. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if any of them are in here. Oh yeah, one of them is. There's one drawing in the other room um, that I hadn't looked at since uh, the early 90s, and I just found it very recently. I was look, looking for it. So I found this Al Parker Jesus drawing from in a sketchbook, and I hadn't seen it, and I was, and I loved it. It was only half the face. It was only half the face, and it's, he's wearing a crown of thorns. And um, it's very beautiful, very, very beautiful. I love the drawing, and I named it Al Parker Jesus because I knew the subtext that it was him and I and I and, and I it was Al Parker slash Jesus <laughs> and um, and I thought it also had that beautiful 
balance of from the profane to the sacred. Right. You know that it was because I mean you know models for artists were very sel were usually prostitutes and and yeah and I thought it was a, a, a sort of perfect accident. I thought having picked this man who had by that time. Um, by the time I looked back at it, found it again, Al Parker had died. Right. So it had a sadness and it mm -hmm. had a power about it because of the coincidence. Mm -hmm. And I, what, what has been a, a, a revelation to me is how much content so many of my drawings have developed because of what has happened since I drew them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That things that were just Accidental or you accidental, and suddenly you, you, you put them in context mm -hmm. of our having gone through the AIDS crisis, and some of these drawings are very, very about that period. Uh -huh. Because when I was doing them, when I was illustrating, in started, I started in 75, but um, I, my drawings were very, very precise and controlled because nothing else in my life was. Sorry. There you go, proof. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would use my drawing as therapy to visualize control uh, right. and order. And they are very precise. Mm -hmm. Because around me, my friends were dropping dead, and I was, I was expecting to drop dead. I mean, sure. I, I had, my first boyfriend died in 83, and it wasn't even AIDS yet. Was not even Red, yeah. yeah. It was something like that, and I and I knew any day now, every cold was going to be the last one. I mean, I would get a cold, and I would think, oh God, this is it. I turn. I didn't know at the time. I have a, one of those HIV resistant genes, and that's why we're here. <laughs> and um, I did not know this for many years, and I really thought I was living on borrowed time, so I worked all the time. And I think as a result of that, my drawings have a certain immediacy about them. Yeah. I think they're very much what's happening in that instant. They, they don't necessarily make you wonder what happened before or after that image. Uh -huh. They're very much in the immediate. Because I really didn't know how much time I had or if I had any time. I mean, I, I, finishing a drawing was like, I've put that one to bed. That's great. You know? And, yeah. and I, I felt like... You know, Rilke would take ten years to write a, a poem, <laughs> and uh, and then he'd write it in a flash overnight. And uh, I, I always felt that way. Like I, I was always drunk uh, through my most productive years. And so, if I could sober up enough to write a chapter, then I'd say, "Oh, yippee! I finished the chapter. I'll wait another two years." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Uh, uh, let, let, let's open it up to the audience. Some of you might have questions. Not. Yes, yes. Uh, what was it like to work with Playboy? The best gig I ever had. <laughs> they were so. They were so nice. Um, Alex Sanchez. Well, no, that was Play, that was Blue oh, Boy. That was Blue Boy. That was Blue yeah. Boy. Um, I I got into Playboy because I had been in Blue Boy, and they had seen my work there. And um, they, they were very, very, um, they got in touch with me. They hooked me up with a terrific art director named Carrick Pope. And um, he and I worked together on all the work I did for them. And um, they gave me like Joyce Carol Oates and Tom Robbins. They gave me like real writers. You know, I was so pleased to be representing this work. They paid me like, I think it was 2,000 a page back then, and I was getting 300 a page for Blue Boy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, and I, I loved working for Blue Boy, and I did some very important work for them, but I needed to pay bills. So um, Playboy was great. They entered all my drawings in illustration competitions. I was winning awards all the time. I didn't even know I was up for, you know. I'd, I'd be thanking people in front of a room, of, you know, getting the Society of Illustrators or something award, and I wouldn't even be sure what the drawing was, necessarily. <laughs> I, and I loved working for Playboy, and the very first drawing I did for them was for a, a Raoul Dahl story called My Uncle Oswald. Mm -hmm. And I did a very homoerotic image of a man in bed a with a stigmata pill in his hand. And I thought, I'm never gonna hear from these people again. <laughs> they are so nice. 
not going to call me back after this. And um, that was, they loved it. They never said, that's too gay. Not one time did Playboy want me to change anything because they thought it was too homoerotic. And a number of the things I did for them were. And they, they were cool with um, Hugh Hefner is a, was a real bohemian. Yeah. He really was. And, and his lesbian daughter was the editor. Right? Yes, Christine. And she was great. She was great, too. I mean, it was, I loved working for them. And the only reason I stopped was that Gene Marshall became such a big deal. I didn't have time to illustrate because I was traveling 20 weekends out of the year. Why did you travel with your dog? I would go to Paris for... Um, for the boy? <laughs> well, I, they, had a, they had a gene convention in Paris. I had to fly there. I would go to London. I, um, I would go to conventions all over the country. I would go to doll shops. I would stand there. People would come up to me, pour out the most intimate secrets of their <laughs> life that, that related to gene somehow. I, and um, and I, I was good at that. I mean, I, my father was a very um, gregarious man. He was very charming. Nobody didn't love him. I mean, he was like my school friends all adored my father. And until I had to do the stuff for Gene, I didn't know if, I had never stood in front of anybody. Illustration's a very solitary yeah. career. You're by yourself and you're by yourself for weeks and, and, and hours and nights. I did a lot of weed during my illustration <laughs> career. A lot of weed. And, um, and as soon as I started having to do appearances for Gene, my father, in me happened, and I could deal with people like I'm. I'm not nervous doing this. I'm. I'm I and I wasn't in those doll shops or in conventions. And such, you know. I and um and and Gene made me so much more money. Oh yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. yeah. I was rich for a short while. Thousand dollars to buy a doll. No, no. Well, the hex. Yeah, some of them did, but the doll itself started like at sixty nine dollars. I I wanted it to be accessible. And then it, it, there were people would you know make clothes, special clothes like um, Jeffrey Bean did a dress for one oh, of my yeah. dolls, and you know and different designers, Carolina Herrera, you know, yeah. and they would sell for like a fortune. And I raised money for gay men's health crisis for years oh, that. doing yeah. that, uh -huh. and I raised like over one hundred and thirty thousand wow. dollars doing that for GMHC. Yeah. And <laughs> and that was that made it that made the whole story in my head of, of Gene and, and what, you know. Your friend who died. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, because, yeah, exactly. Any more questions? Yeah. How did it come about that, uh, that brought you together to write the introduction for Dream? Uh, Ed Iwanaki. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. he said, I was doing, um, I had a book published in Japan called um, First Eyes, and um, I don't know how it happened. I, oh yeah, I had a license. I had a, a literary agent, um, Susan Schulberg, and she approached Penguin and they wanted to do a book of my drawings. And I was elated because yeah. the Japanese book, I think maybe 2,000 copies of it, had made it into this country. And um, Ed evidently knew you and said, would you like, because I had done the, the the first book cover I ever did was for Nocturnes for the King of Naples. And I Which is the book I wrote. Yeah. And it was and it had been I had loved doing it. it and, and I and I had I read the book and it was so visual. I mean your your descriptions of things are so incredibly visceral. You yeah. you, you, you smell it, you yeah. you see it. Well, and well you do. And um, I And your cover was so remarkable because uh, most book, book covers were so kind of cookie cutter and uninspiring and, uh, and to have a real artist finally do something so original. Uh, it was an angel smoking a cigarette and uh, it, he looked really decadent. <laughs> he was a waiter in my neighborhood. He was a waiter. <laughs> And, and I was, I drew him surreptitiously. I would go, I would go, it was a restaurant no longer there called Shelter. And there was this really beautiful blonde waiter who looked like very decadent, like you said, and very beautiful. And I started like going with my sketchbook and um, a pencil and I'd go there and I would li literally do this and, and. Do you think he ever knew? No, no, I don't think so. I never told him and because I, I don't know. I, I, 
I, did, I just couldn't imagine how he would react. If he would be angry, if he would, you know, say, "I want a percentage," you know, you know, yeah. you, you never know. And um, and I, the wing is the wing from the Hamilton Fountain at the end of my street. Um, I mean, it was oh, like yeah. it was all. I mean, he came from one corner, and the wing came from another corner, and and I just thought the cigarette in his mouth was the perfect way to kind of trash yeah. a classic image, a classical image, to yeah. make it have. Uh, an edge to it. Like the Venus de Milo was not. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, and, and then I did it and it, it came out on the cover and, and then it was posters and, yeah. and I've seen people, you know, try to duplicate it with models and, and it, it, it really was like such a... A, a breakthrough for both of them. It, it really was. It changed the direction of my career. I started doing book covers after that, cause, and they paid much more money than just a single drawing for a magazine. You know, they only had one image to get right. So you'd go in and they'd say, we'll pay you $8,000, and he's like, oh my God. You know, that's, oh yeah. And, um, and I read everything that I did the covers for, for many, many, many years, because I wanted, I was that guy. I wanted to feel like I knew what I was actually depicting. And when you get something as beautifully written as yours, and as, as moving, it makes your job, it, you want to do something great for it. You want, it ups your game. Well, you did. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I first saw your work on covers by books, of books by one of my favorite authors, uh, Ruth Rendell. Yes. Uh, can you say anything about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another wonderful gig. Um, I was given a, a, actually one of the drawings here is for Ruth, it's the woman, woman with her hand over her face oh, like yeah. that. Yeah. That was for, the first drawing I ever did for Ruth Rendell was that drawing. And um, she was, Ruth Rendell, for anyone who doesn't know, is an amazing British mystery writer. I mean, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Many, many movies, Live Flesh, the first English Pedro Almodovar film was one of her books. She's an amazing writer. And she, I didn't know this, she picked me. She had, she, and I became friends with her. She would come to town and we would go to tea and, and um, she's British and she, her, her, she has a husband who looks like a country squire with mutton chop. I mean, it was, it was, they, were, they were lovely people, I loved them. And, I, and she took me from publisher to publisher for years. She would be, you know, be doing books with one publisher and then she would be doing another series, perhaps a book. And she would say, we, I want Mel Odom to do the cover. So I, I was like, in love, you know. Th <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I, you know, I am your humble slave. And she came for tea to my house, and I would ask her. I asked her one time, because she's a very, she's a lovely woman, very civilized, very, um, very civilized, very kind. And the, there are some sick people in her books, and I couldn't understand how she understood them. It's like Joyce Carol Oates. Yes. I mean, who's a, a really close friend of mine. And who is so proper that you can, if you say a dirty word, she blushes. But all of her characters are axe murderers. Yes. Well, that's the same thing. That's the same thing. I asked. I, I said, Ruth, how do you know what these sick f words, because um, it's being taped, um, are like? I don't understand. She said she had one basic premise for all of her books, and that was that people, once people can dehumanize a person, and by calling them a name, that's a faggot, that's a nigger, mm -hmm. that's a Jew. Mm -hmm. Once you stop thinking of them as less than you, you can do anything to them, yeah. guilt-free. And I, th now, whenever I, I, whenever I see the news, that goes through my head. Uh -huh. Because it's, it's such a truth, such a truth. And her books are so wonderful. There's one, one called Judgment Written in Stone, maybe my favorite that I did for her, and it's about a, a very upper, upper, upwardly mobile, well-to-do well family, um, very educated, hires a maid who is illiterate, and she doesn't, they don't know she's illiterate, and they leave notes for her and stuff, for, you know, pick up the laundry and stuff like that. And she's crazy, too, she's a Christian fundamentalist. Mm -hmm which is kind of crazy as far as I'm concerned these days. And um, she starts thinking of these notes as traps they're setting for her. They're trying to find out. They're trying to, and she murders them all. 
And she tells you that like within the first two pages of the book. And the rest of it is one of the most beautifully written train wrecks I've ever read in my life. Because you know what's coming. She's told you what's coming. Yeah. And you start seeing the light <laughs> in the distance. And you're so, so afraid for these people that you've come to care about. And it's just coming. And it's mm -hmm. her crazy. Yeah. And it's her ignorance and her lack of education that is, that is the most damning book against illiteracy and, and, and lack of education that I've ever read in my life. And I loved doing Ruth Rendell's covers because they were always important subjects. I'm sorry, I'm going on about this probably too. No, long. that's probably what you wanted to hear. Uh, one, more, one more question? Yes, sir. I was wondering if, oh sorry, in the 80s if you felt like there was a more sense of community with other illustrators, and did that dissipate as time went on? Well, they died. That's what dissipated. I was um, George Stavrino was, yeah, was he the lived next door to me. Yeah. Lovely, lovely yeah. guy, sweet, sweet man. One of the first was the first illustrator to come up and say, "Let's be friends. I think your talent is is wonderful." And we became. He lived. I live on seventy six. He lived on eighty six. And we would see each other. We traded drawings. I have a beautiful drawing of his. He had several drawings of mine. Um, and he. Uh, and I knew look, Antonio and, and Richard Amsell, I knew, and one by one these people died. And um, I, that's what, that's what made it, that's what dis dissipated that. It, was, it wasn't that people stopped caring about each other, it was that they, everyone died. And, and during a lot of these, I'm what, thinking I'm next. So it may be fear into that too. And also, illustration is a fairly solitary profession. Right, like you said. And you have to make occasions to be together, you know? I, I think for me, sort of two themes emerge from our talk today. One is beauty. I mean, you're an addict of beauty, and all of your work is beautiful. Yeah, you're, you're, you're an addict. <laughs> And, uh, and the other thing is uh, this, we've come back again and again to AIDS mm. and the tragedy of AIDS, which um, is one of the great modern yeah. themes of our time. Uh, oftentimes forgotten. Now I think people are beginning to remember it, partly because the, the people who lived through it have all died off. It's like, it's like the World War II, the <coughs> collaborators in France, right. nobody mentioned it as long as they were alive. Then they all started to die, and now people talk about it. Right. It's, it's, I, it is one of the defining things in my life, yeah. in that it happened, the first person I ever fell in love with as an adult died from it. Mm -hmm. And at the time, by anything science, had said, I was going to die soon. Mm -hmm. It was years later before I found out about the gene that you and I share. And it made me live in the present in a way I don't know that I would have been able to had it not been that I wasn't positive the present wasn't all I had. Yeah. And, I, and, and, I, and I used, I drew all the time, I used my work to not go nuts. Right. You know? I mean, there's a precision and a uh, a, a kind of utopian aspect to your work that I think is born out of that. Yeah, uh, I, 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 uh, I think you're right. And looking nice back on it, when I walked in here, I, when the show, when Daniel had hung the show, I came in to see it all by, by myself. I was so overwhelmed by the work on the wall. I don't mean like impressed, I mean like, and I said this to somebody, it was like seeing pages from my diary but uh -huh. out of order. Uh -huh. And I, I, he'll tell you, I couldn't spell. I was having difficulty talking. I was like, humana, humana, humana. You know, I, 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 I was completely overwhelmed by it because it was, when I look at a drawing, I remember what was going on at the time I did the drawing and, and who I was with and who maybe the model for something was. And, and How long would it take you to do a drawing like that? Oh, three weeks. Three weeks. And, and you, 
So you really live with it. You live with it. And I don't, I don't mean like a couple hours a day, like long, like, like I would work, I would start in the afternoon, I would work till nine, then I would smoke weed and work till two. Oh, good. Yeah, that was, that, I mean, and, the, and, and, what, what coffee was the Balzac? <laughs> well, I, I drank a lot of coffee, too. Yeah. I drank a lot of coffee, too. But the weed would reshuffle my aesthetic. Yeah. And it would make me look at it differently. I mean, it would be like I would, because when you're working on a drawing, you're sitting there staring at a piece of paper for hours. Mm -hmm. And you have to think what you're doing. And then it's it can be very ex exhausting because you that's what you're doing. You're sitting there working on piece of you know yeah um, and then you smoke something that rearranges your your whatever I don't even know technically what it does but and you look at it differently and you see rhythms that I would do subconsciously but not recognize and then I'd go oh my god look at that and I'd be so happy I had, had that I would had smoked that um, it, it, it became, I was, I, I wrote, all of my pot was written off on income tax uh. <laughs> under art supplies. <laughs> Oh my God, I just saw it. 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 Oh my